There's a river. Let's see what he had. Aces. All right. He had aces, guys. Ends up stacking off to me when he had me completely dominated pre-flop. Let's look at that with the card shown. This shows you the equities here. Um, I've got 18%. This guy's actually got 20, yeah, 20, 22. Uh, forgive me, 80, 82% more or less. Um, not shown probably because the other player here. Let's see. Yeah. And now you see the reason why you shouldn't just min raise flat. Let's say, let's say he's looking for, you know, when he min raises here, this guy flats, I re raise, he should automatically shove or at least, at least four bet. At least four bet here because he doesn't want this guy hanging out with any kind of pocket pair. He doesn't want me hanging out with any kind of suited connector, maybe squeeze, three bet squeezing light. Right? And that's, again, this is, this is why these reversed implied odds are so strong with these big hands, hands guys. And I would just, as a general rule, especially for those of you who are getting started, just you know, raise those up in general. Raise them up. If you can get it all in pre-flop, you're happy. You're going to get it in, on average, at 80% ahead of your opposition. Why not? Uh, he only flats. And yeah. <laughs> Get sucked out real hard. But if he had... Okay, in this case, of course, with my kings, I'm, I'm playing for stacks anyways. But I'm not going to have this hand a lot. And when he four bets me, I'm probably going to let that go. Right? In, in many cases. Doesn't do it. You know, he lets me draw cheaply. And I check raise, get it all in at 90% equity. And end up taking it down. Uh, the money that stays in the middle here, guys, is the rake that is taken from every pot. So let's talk about a few key statistics that I think are pretty unknown. It's, it's common knowledge among expert professional players, but uh, they're pretty unknown, I think, against the, the general the general player uh, player out there, especially online. And what I've done is uh, basically taken a few of your very standard hands and wanted to show you guys what you know what the mathematical truth is of of hitting flops. So the typical big slick here suited, ace king suited, you're gonna receive that hand dealt one time in 332 total total hands you play. So not a hell of a lot. <laughs> now the odds of flopping. Um, either an ace or a king, or let's say a, at least an ace or a king, is only 32.4%, more or less one time in three. So that means both you and your opposition, if they're, if they're on non-pocket pairs, will miss that flop two times in three. Right? 66% of the time. Realize that. Play with that. that that's the power also of the c-bet. You guys should definitely check that out, right? One time in three, you're going to hit. Two times in three, you're going to miss with this hand. That's how it is. Only one in 29 flop two pair or better. <laughs> so one in 29 flops, you're going to have two pair or better when you're holding ace-king suited pre-flop. This is the big number that I want you guys to look at. One in nine flops a flush draw. Okay, not a flush, a flush draw. It's about 11%, okay? Remember this number, this nine number. How often will you flop a flush when you're holding any two suited cards? It doesn't matter which. One time in 119 flops will you flop the flush. Just highly unlikely, guys. So again, these weak, weak rank cards, even though they're suited, don't don't even fool with it. You know, and especially when you're out of position, a lot of times. If you don't have post flop lines where you can push your opponents off of their hands. It's really risky business because you're only going to flop that big, big flush, 119, uh, 118 to one, against. You will hit the flush draw <laughs> one time in nine approximately. Good pocket pairs will be dealt one time in 17 deals. That means 5.88 percent of the time you're going to have a pocket pair, any pocket pair from twos to aces, when you check your hole cards. All right, what are the odds of flopping a set or better? As I just mentioned, basically 7.5 to 1 against. So you will hit a set or better. That means, that means it's example, you hold a pair of fives. The five then comes on the flop. Exactly flopping that set is also right at 11%, so one time in nine. However, you're also going to play on when you flop a full house or a four of a kind, which are highly unlikely. Um, but you know this is the real number you need to know, 7.5 to 1 against. So one time in eight and a half, you're going to hit. Ergo, <laughs> flatting or cold calling as a set mining move can be done when you have, or the effective stack size, say, 
is more or less nine times the amount that you have to call. So you basically, when you have those pocket pairs from twos to tens again, then you're looking for that third rank of that pair, and that's going to come about one time in nine, more or less. There you go. As long as your opponent and you, right, have at least nine times the amount to call, it's doable. It's doable. Then there's the adage, no set, no bet, <laughs> if you do have the underpair. No set, no bet. With the set, you're probably going to get the other guy to stack off, depending on his playing style. Very good. Now, one in five pocket pairs hits the set by the river. Also important number. You're going to see that a lot. This You've probably seen it watching the World Series of Poker, stuff like that on TV, where they show the equity matchups, the uh, win chances in the, uh, yeah, the player screen, so to say. And yeah, you see that number quite a lot. Right with these under pairs versus over pairs, the reason is more or less this. That's it depends a bit on the suits. Um, yeah, whatever. But yeah, on average, that's what you're looking at. Good max stretch suited connectors already defined at 54 to jack 10. And look at this. You're gonna flop the open ended straight draw, also about one time in nine, more or less. Now you're only gonna flop the straight with a max stretch. That means non gap. Max stretch 54 to the jack 10 one time in 76 and a half. So it's more or less 75 to 1 against you flopping a straight. 118 to 1 against flopping a flush when you hold two suited cards. <laughs> Welcome to the bitter truth of mathematical plays here. You're not going to flop that flush very often. When you do, you know, do the happy dance. <laughs> but don't bank on it. All right? You're not going to flop that straight even with a non-gapper but one time in, yeah, 76, 77 pulls. So again, when you do happy dance time, <laughs> why not? What's the difference? Well, suited hands and your max stretch connectors, right? And of course, the max stretch can also be suited, but we're just looking at this as an offsuit connector, max stretch, and a 82 suited cards. When you do hit that flop, right, when you get a piece of it, you're going to be flopping more often than not the draw when you're holding suited cards and you're going to be flopping more often than not the draw when you're holding your connectors whereas when you're holding your pocket pairs and you hit hard at approximately the same percentage of the time you're going to have a mate hand and a monster hand because your set against even top pair top kicker is yeah upwards of 95 percent ahead of any top pair like that so yet again one of our best friends poker stove it is again provided for free and let's say we've got our fivesies, which was the example I believe I was speaking of. And our friend has the old big slick suited, ace king suited. All right, what's the pre flop matchup? Well, as a principal, guys, anytime you've got a pair and somebody's got two over cards, in general, the matchup is about 55 to 45%. There's about a 10% difference here. If if it's if it's suited, it's a bit it's a bit closer. Let's see exactly what they put. Yeah, so this is okay. So he's suited, so he's a bit closer at 52 to 48. And this is a typical coin toss that you guys talk about all the time. Let's look at Ace King offsuit. And there you go. Yeah, about 55, right? So that's the difference. Um, pre flop. So again, you're flipping. Let's say the board comes. Five, um, okay, let's make this exact. Five of diamonds, five of hearts. Uh, ace of oh, spades, king of spades, very good. Let's reevaluate that with the exact suits here. So we don't have any, any suits blocking this guy. Makes it a bit better. Flop comes five of spades, uh, six of hearts, why not? And the king of Oh, hearts. No, king of diamonds just to make it a rainbow board. Boom. There you go. This guy flops exactly what he's looking for. He's got top air, top kicker on a rainbow board. He thinks he's good, right? Wrong. <laughs> he has only 5.56% equity to the river versus that flop set. Pretty, pretty sick, guys. So just understand that this flop set is very, very powerful. Something else I want to show you is this. Let's let's go ahead and assume that he's also on top pair, top kicker, plus the nut flush draw. That does help quite a bit, right? Um, he's up to 30%, but let's say 
The next card comes and it's a King of Hearts. King of Hearts, right? So he's now tripped up. Ace King is now tripped up on this board, and he's so he's again. This guy's probably doing the happy dance right now on the turn, right? Wow. <laughs> now he's only got 16% to the river, right? Because now I'm full. All right, I've got fives full of kings, and he's still got the nut flush draw on his mind plus the yeah best set and best kicker, or best trip, say. Yeah, top pair, top kicker, guys. Those are the hands that you stack off with quite a lot. You know, when you run into this kind of stuff, just be aware of it. It's going to happen uh, definitely in the sessions that you'll see from me in the near future. I'm sure we'll stack off more than once uh, versus sets. It, it's just part of the game. Um, remember the principle that we'll get into here shortly. Big pots with big hands, small pots with small hands. And, you know, top pair, top kicker is a good hand. It's not a big hand. Big hands are two pair better. I want you guys to realize that. All right, so another one here. We've got... Uh, fives versus a 78 suited, let's say. Now that's a really, really close matchup, right? 78 suited versus the fives. Pre-flop, more or less one to one. Here comes the flop, five, six, king of diamonds, two suited, which also happen to be the suits of the max stretch connector here. Okay, now my set is markedly, markedly worse than the top pair, top kicker versus this guy who didn't even hit a pair. He's got an open and a straight draw for the five, six, seven, eight, and he's got then the full nine clean outs for the flush, giving him 42% on the flop, 42% on the flop with his draw alone versus my flop set. Pretty intense, right? Let's say the same card comes, I think it was a king of hearts, and now all of a sudden, it really, really turns, right? Because I've got the full house. And this guy has essentially only the straight flush draw remaining. <laughs> let's look at let's look at the nine of hearts, which I would consider a blank given my hand, right? Because I don't put this guy on the 78 necessarily. Wow. Now I've got my set of fives and I probably push on that turn to protect against the flush draw. However, this guy has completed his straight, is about 80% ahead of me. These are things you guys need to be aware of. Um, these kind of hands will be raised and re-raised, especially in six max play. The other thing is too, you know, this top air top kicker, if you do the happy dance too soon and you see a couple of low, low cards on that flop, just at least at, as a bare minimum, have the set in your mind. Have, you know, the, the connecting cards in your mind have the potential flush rolls in your mind and utilize all that knowledge to your advantage and also in in many cases you want to be playing your ace kings you know when you flop that top pair top kicker for pot control <laughs> as sick as it sounds um, let's say yeah I mean best case scenario when you flop top pair top kicker and then that flush draw you're still 70% behind a flop flush or flop set that's the, that's the truth of it, guys. So, again, top pair, top kicker, it's a good hand. It's not necessarily a big hand. Big hands are two pair or better. So, concerning betting, let's keep it simple. Uh, if you're taking notes, the limp is going to be indicated with a big L. Uh, flatting is going to be CC or cold calling. 3X, right? You want to three times the raise behind you. You want to three time it. That's indicated as an R and OR would then be an open raise. Or you're simply going to push and fold, right? Depending on depending on your pot to uh, stack ratio, depending on bet size to effective stack ratio, stuff like that. All right, something that's also not so well known out there. Uh, my experience, both in yeah casinos and general house games uh, around the world, is this idea of a pot raise. Okay, it is not necessarily just betting the pot amount. The actual raise formula, and it's very important for you uh, pot limit Omaha or future pot limit Omaha players out there, it's the pot, it's the current pot plus two times the amount you need to call. So I've given you guys a couple of examples here. Let's say we're playing the NL100 just to make it simple, right? So um, small blinds 50, big blinds a buck, and that's how it is. So we've got 1.5 for the blinds. All right, one is your call amount. And if you want to raise it up pot size, you're going to raise it to right, the amount of 
The amount of the pot, 1.5 plus 2 to call, and that's 3.5 big blinds. All right, let's say you get flatted. Uh, flop comes, and the pot is now 8 bucks. All right, small blind bets it out for 6 big blinds, or $6 in our example. My pot size raise is going to be the 8 plus the 6, giving me the total pot size of 14, plus twice the amount to call for 12, i.e. 26. What does this do? Why would you want to make a pot size bet? Well, <laughs> because you know exactly the odds, the pot odds that you're giving your opponent, namely 2 to 1. When your opponent's getting 2 to 1 pot odds, because of your pot size raise, then he needs, as I've written here, 33% equity if he's going to call all in. And yeah, you guys definitely need to look at um, drawing odds, completion odds for the No Limit Hold'em game. If you're unfamiliar with that, you can find it at Wikipedia or Wikipedia. And yeah, definitely have a look at that. But if you're on a flush draw on the flop in general, right, you're only going to hit it um, okay, exactly at 34.97% of the time. Uh, if you're on an open and a straight draw, right at 31.45%, etc. etc., you know, call it more or less 32% on average for any open and straight draw, any even uh, any flush draw. And yeah, that's going to be right at the equity needed to make that call. So that's going all in on the flop, right? And in general, you're only going to have 19%, you know, to complete your flush draw on any given card coming into either the turn or the river. And yeah, that's that's kind of the idea there, guys, with these pot pot size raises. You know exactly that your opponent's getting two to one odds, and that he needs 33% equity with any holding to break even if calling all in. Good. And again, with our keeping it simple here for betting, you know, on most dry boards, when I say a dry board, guys, in the sessions, it's going to be when there's three cards of different suits. Okay, so it's going to be a so-called rainbow board and relatively unconnected board concerning the ranks. So about half pot on those kind of dry boards and two-thirds to three-fourths pot on the wet boards. It means two suited, uh, connected boards, stuff like that. Ah, and <laughs> quick side note, approximately 60% of all the flops that you'll see will be two suited. So by and large, you're going to be either drawn to the flush or worried about the flush. And so just, yeah, it's also a good number to have in mind, you know, about 60% of all flops will have two suits. <laughs> uh, something to keep your eye on just to test that out. All right, here we go. A uh, little recommendation. We've got here call 9x. That's the rule with twos to 10 for so-called set value. And again, be very, very aware that you have nine times in the effective stack size. And that may be the stack size of your opponent when you're making that call. All right, that's, that's kind of the prerequisite for that. Uh, concerning the implied odds, and then here I've got this call 15 when in position <laughs> with suited connectors and suited ace-x hands. Okay, so you can, you can either call when you have 15 times the amount to call, or you can 3-bet it, right? You can change it up. You, of course, of course can fold, and yeah, everything's at your disposal, but with the suited connectors, you by and large want to be playing in position after multiple callers or multiple limpers. Because, as I just uh, indicated, I think in a slide or two ago, um, when you hit with your with your suited hands or your connected hands, it's very often going to be a draw, not a made hand. So then you're going to have to, you know, deal with c bets on the flop, maybe even the turn. And you know, if these guys are good, they're not going to give you the odds to draw. So, you know, when you're when you're calling those in position, yeah, about 15 times the amount to call should be enough. <laughs> to uh, get you there yeah, EV wise in the long run especially if your opponents are able to stack off again with top pair top kicker and <laughs> other holdings alright so here we go betting continued if a better raise or a call is greater than or equal to 50% of your stack or by making that bet raise or call you will be pot committed on the next betting round <laughs> And this is generally when your stack is less than or equal to the pot, then you're going to push or fold directly. That's what I've coined in other videos that I've done, um, essential poker knowledge videos, uh, the golden rule of betting. All right, so it's it, you know of course well known fact among experts, um, advanced players, but yeah, many new players who just just play poker for fun, um, which which may include a lot of you guys out there. You know, there's nothing wrong with playing cards for fun, man, and, and enjoying it. 
But when you have these different rules, um, you just just general principles, right? Your your game will skyrocket. And one of them here is again this golden rule of betting, and that's basically not just fooling around with little men bets and men raises and stuff like that. If you're going to make a bet, raise or call, and it's going to commit more than half your stack, you're not asking yourself, hmm, should I call this? And <laughs> you know, you're saying, okay, is, is this a push or a fold spot? And that's yeah, that's pretty much how you play it. All right, again, mind the pot to the effective stack ratio. And I showed you guys in the one example hand um, where I was playing you know, the effective stack size, not my stack size, which was a bigger deep stack. Good, and you always, again, want to put the final question to your opponents. Keep the initiative and so-called tier and fold equity on your side. Uh, another quick tip, if it's good enough for a call, it's often good enough for a raise. Again, without you know, borrowing speculative hands in position after two or more numbers of cold callers. Uh, final point here, pushing or jamming. That means going all in. Okay, you'll hear me say push. You'll you'll hear me say shove. You'll hear me say jam it. Uh, all means the same. It's basically just putting everything that you've got in front of you across the line, going all in, and that's going to give you the maximum amount of fold equity. And also, if you can if you can shove, and you think that let's say for example your opposition maybe has, yeah, maybe your opposition's a bit more skilled post flop and you're worried about them kind of shoving you off of hands, uh, one of the best defenses you have is actually pushing. That means, you know, if you can get in in pre-flop with a, with a premium hand, you don't have to worry about one of these guys sucking out on you, maybe maybe floating you, stuff like that, outplaying you post-flop, pushing you off a of hand. If you can, if you can shove with the, uh, with the best of it, you can basically write off any skill differences that might be there, i.e. the edge that certain players have post-flop by pushing or jamming pre-flop. It's also a really good tip for a lot of um, beginning and rec players, and uh, as I've been seeing here in these approximately 10,000 hands at, uh, at the Storm Tables now, there are a lot of guys who buy in for that, that minimum stack size of 30 big blinds, and they're doing exactly this. Right? They're playing, some of them are playing a really effective, I think, uh, mid-stack strategy, and yeah, you're going to see a lot of, that, a lot of that shoving going on right? for, for small mid-stacks. And it's something that I want to use my uh, pot odds calculator to show you exactly how you can react to that. Uh, we'll get there, I think, in a slide or two. Moving right along, we've got here tips and tricks, number one, for Storm Poker and also for poker in general. The yeah, Dylan Pitt principle here, that is position plus initiative equals profit. All right, I want you guys to be focusing on in position play as much as you can make the first aggressive move, make the last aggressive move. Do it from the button very often. Um, be in position as often as you can. Keep that initiative on your side. Put the pressure on your opponents, not the other way around. So here we go. Uh, with the small mid pockets uh, versus early position, mid position, pre-flop raisers, you should try you know, to set mine in general rather than three betting. Okay, especially when, for example, in the storm poker tables, the HUD, the heads up display for hold a manager, it, at this point, doesn't function. I just got a response back from those guys, and uh, they're looking for a solution. But as of now, we can't use the HUD actively in real-time play. So we can use it after the fact, of course, analyzing hands. But um, yeah, as a decision enhancer in real-time, it's unfortunately not set up for that. So again, consider EP and MP raisers um, relatively. <laughs> again, it depends on the opponent. but. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a stronger hand in general from early position than it will be from middle position, than it will be from the cutoff, than it will be from the button. So that's, yeah, as a general rule, just know that. So if you got a small mid pocket, you don't necessarily want to go raising over the top, right? Setting yourself up for example, somebody with queens or better who then four bets you and you're sitting there with your pair of fives and saying, oh shit, I probably should have just flatted. And, you know, checked out the flop for relatively cheap. And yeah, set mine, so to say. I'm looking for the five no set, no bet, and get out cheaply. Yeah, so if you got those crazy implied odds uh, that I just showed you in Poker Stove, when you do hit your set versus top pair, top kicker kind of hands, and you're also ahead of 15 card draws, and yeah, you're, <laughs> you're just super, super strong with that set, that flop set. So that's gonna be one of our best friends probably for, um, yeah, big pot play, and that's, that's something we'll be focusing on, but definitely guys, pit principle, Position plus initiative equals profit. Last point here, big tip. Do not call a turn bet. 
if you're not willing to call a large riverbed or even a shove or a push from your opponent. So that means if you're on the turn, the turn's really the the turning point, so to say, um, in most hands. And that means, am I gonna, am, am I playing for stacks here or not? Uh, depending on the previous action. But yeah, if it's a big bet on the turn, don't just flat if you're not willing to call another another bet on the river. You can do so, however, if you're getting the pot odds for your draw and you know that there's implied odds after the fact. That means you can even make some, in some cases, you know, uh, calls where you don't have direct odds to make that to make that call giving your draw but you do have the implied odds meaning that when you do hit uh, you can you can basically bank on your opponent uh, shoving over the rest of his stack to your side of the table and that's yeah these are also these are also different ideas that you should definitely have in your mind but in general don't call the turn if you're not willing to call a large river bet uh, the worst thing you can do is make a call on any even street just to let it go on the next uh, without without again the implied odds to do so good so low stakes guys tips and tricks to reduce continued aggression in general if your opponents are playing back at you fish do not bluff <laughs> as a general rule I mean, yeah, from time to time you know they try to get tricky and just kind of flail around but in general fish don't bluff if the passive or the weak bet believe it nine times in ten you'll be saving money you won't be bleeding money let's say in the long run so in many cases we want to opt for pot control with top pairs and over pairs and I just showed you guys why uh, and also in other way ahead way behind spots WAWB way ahead way behind instead of value maximization ie sell it when you got it now again small pots with small hands big pots with big hands and I'll probably mention that 45 times before the series out um, what's a small hand? Well, small or good hand is top pair or an over pair. Big hands are two pair better and also nut draws in many cases. It means in Texas Hold'em, you know, 12 to 15 outs are better. So, yeah, that's, that's a principle that you really got to let sink in. Top pair and over pair. That's not a monster, guys. Post flop. It's not, in most cases. <laughs> and yeah, depending on the pre-flop action, if you're in a four bet or five bet pot, then your over pair aces is probably good in general, <laughs> in general. However, um, if you're in you know only two bet or three bet pots, as you've just seen in two example hands, if somebody's set mining or even you know calling or raising light with suited connectors and they actually connect hard with the flop, you may well be uh, an absolute underdog as soon as that flop comes so yeah take it take it in context but again top pairs over pairs good hands in general not big hands so you know not always but often you're gonna want to play that for pot control and you're gonna want to play your big hands you know your flop sets your flop two pair your occasional flop straight or flush etc um, yeah four for stacks not the other way around <laughs> Again, don't quote me out of context. In general, uh, it's something that I think will save you guys a lot of money in the long run if you adhere to this one very simple principle. Again, small pots, small hands, big pots, big hands. What's a big hand? Two pair better. So, low stakes, red flags. What are those? Well, any min raise, as we already saw in the example hand, is in general pretty strong. Um, not always, not always, but... Uh, against especially fish and novice players, the min raise of the limp raise is a big red flag that you should, wa you should definitely watch out for, as well as the so-called out of position float line. What is that? It's basically when somebody, let's say on the flop, checks it, you raise or you make a bet in position, and then that player calls. Okay, the turn comes, and the villain or your opponent there bets into you on the turn. So it's basically a check call on the flop and then a, a bet or a push on the turn <laughs> that equals serious strength nine times in ten. So yeah, yeah, I've kind of given you guys a couple of examples here, but in that spot, be able to fold those top pairs and over pairs. It's, it's very important. Um, you'll see me definitely not fold those top pairs and over pairs um, <laughs> versus those lines, and then you guys can maybe just tally it up and see how I do over time 
in the in the cases where I don't adhere to this rule. Right, it's a big, big red flag. Again, nine times in ten at the low stakes, at least. So good. Do not semi bluff if your opponent can't fold. Take the free card versus the stations, and value bet them when you complete. In by and large, you know, semi bluff is when you've already seen the flop. You kind of know where you stand because the flop, and of course, as you guys all know, very much determines your hand both in Hold'em and in Omaha. And so, yeah, you're sitting there on the flop. Let's say in in Texas Hold'em. And you've got again here the 78 suited, right? You've got the open and a straight draw and the flush draw, and you give yourself the full 15 outs. So you don't have a made hand, but you have a huge amount of equity just based on your draw alone, right? So your 15 your 15 out flops are going to give you, if you were to push on the flop every single time you've got 15 clean outs, approaching infinity, you know you're going to have 54 percent equity of completing that draw either on the turn or the river, and, and that's huge. It's absolutely huge. Actually, with those 15 out draws, you're ahead of most uh, top pairs and top kickers. But again, guys, guess what? <laughs> Never take my word for it, or any other coach for that matter, but ask for the proof. And where's the proof? <laughs> well, poker stove, by and large. We're holding 87 suited, 8 of spades, 7 of spades, and our opponent has a big slick suited of hearts. Preflop matchup, 2 cards versus uh, two over cards versus two under cards, very typically a 60-40 split. Uh, another point I'd like to make is that um, under pairs versus over pairs is very often a 20-80 split. And anytime you have a laced hand, for example, uh, let's do ace-jack just as an example versus queen-10, why not? This is so-called laced hand, so ace-queen-jack-10 is also at about 60-40, depending on the suited suitedness, etc. But that'll give you a general orientation concerning your matchups. Good. So here we go with the old eight of spades, seven of spades. And again, we're at 40% preflop if we were to push versus the ace king of hearts. All right, flop comes. Five, six of our suit and the king. So he gets top pair, top kicker. And we flop our 15 out flush and open in a straight draw. Right? So what does that mean? Any four and any nine is gonna make our open in a straight draw. And any spade is gonna make our flush, but we have to take out two spades, so we have to discount two outs because they're included in the straight draw out set. So again, look guys, this guy flops top pair, top kicker, and is behind us on the flop. Behind us. We don't have anything but a draw, and we're ahead of him. Right, fifty-six percent. I hope that's shocking for a lot of you guys. That's you know that's the strength of the draw, and that's where you should be getting active with those big flops. And yeah, <laughs> problem is, let's say the turn comes and it's a blank, uh, ten of hearts. What happens to our equity here? Goes straight down the toilet from fifty-six, wouldn't it? Fifty-one. Yeah, fifty-six percent to. 34% inside of one card. So again, I mean, time to get active is on the flop with those big nuts. Yeah, not necessarily nut, but big, big draws, you know, 12 outs, 15 outs plus. Uh, another good one is maybe something that a lot of guys don't realize. So again, this is Dylan for MyBad.com, wishing you all the best and definitely best of luck at your next storm table.